Thank you, Hisham, for that very lovely introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you for the program on Arab Reform and Democracy and the Arab Studies Institute for hosting this and uh, for making me the uh, guinea pig in the live streaming uh, experiment. Uh, <clears throat> this is more or less a precy of a book that I handed in to Stanford University Press yesterday. Uh, there is still time to make considerable changes, so I would appreciate uh, any suggestions with, in that regard that you may have, uh, including the title. I'm not thrilled with this title. Um, I want to make clear what I am and I'm not saying. The book is written against the idea that the Arab popular uprisings of 2011 were Facebook revolutions. Now that doesn't mean that young people and social media were not a significant factor in those uprisings. They were, no doubt about it. However, what I'm focusing on here are two things in contrast to that. One, a much longer term historical context, I am a historian after all, uh, that relates to the economic transformation of the entire Middle East and North Africa, indeed the entire world, um, from the late 1970s, 1980s on. And two, uh, in particular, mobilizations and contestations, including a very large number of strikes of workers in the decade preceding the <coughs> uprisings of 2011, which contributed a great deal to the culture of protest that made those uprisings possible. Now, I pick Egypt and Tunisia uh, because they have uh, the biggest, uh, the most active workers' movements uh, in the Middle East, and uh, Egypt at least is a place where I've been studying this phenomenon for a very long time. And in doing so, there is immediately a problem. Between 1998 and 2010, there was an enormous movement of strikes, sit-ins, demonstrations, and other forms of collective action by Egyptian workers. Uh, we are talking about well over 2 million people, probably over 4 million people involved in these actions. And if you <coughs> multiply that by five, which is the average size of an Egyptian family, and add their bakers and their grocers and so on, this is an enormous social movement. You had a similar, but much smaller and less intense, all of Tunisia is half the size of Cairo, so there's that problem, movement in Tunisia. The one uh, exception in Tunisia where there was an extraordinarily strong and persistent movement was a six-month-long rebellion of unemployed people primarily, but also employed uh, in the Gafsa phosphate mining base in Tunisia is one of the major phosphate exporting uh, regions uh, of the world. So despite the fact that you had this enormously powerful movement in Egypt, workers and trade unions had almost no political influence in post-Mubarak Egypt, and it looks like it will be even less under Sisi than it was before he was installed in office last June. In contrast, the UGTT, which is the Tunisian Federation of Trade Unions, has been absolutely central and is the single most important reason that Tunisia is a democracy today. So, the something about these two uh, trade union federations. The Tunisian Labor Federation, the Union Générale des Travailleurs Tunisiens, was established in 1946, 10 years before Tunisia became independent from France, and it was the single most important social base of the nationalist movement. So, it was, from its origins, supported by the Nationalist Party, the neo distour Party, but it was always independent from them, and it always had a capacity to uh, maneuver uh, and do things that the party leadership and then the state leadership, once the Tunisia became independent, uh, might not have preferred. By contrast, the Egyptian Trade Union Federation is completely a character of the Nasserist state. There was quite a strong trade union movement in Egypt in the 1940s and in the early 1950s before the uh, coup d'etat that brought the free officers to power in 1952. It continued in the early 1950s and was uh, one section of it critical to confirming Nasser in power. 
but the officers did not trust civilian organizations that they did not control. And therefore, ultimately, when they realized we have to have uh, something which is called the National Trade Union Federation, the government created it. Uh, and ETUF, the Egyptian Trade Union Federation, remains uh, effectively an apparatus of the state until this day. So one big difference historically, going all the way back to 40s and 50s, the relative autonomy of the UGTT as compared to ETUF with regard to their respective states. Second, UGTT from its origins and until today has had a very important presence of radicals. They are concentrated among white collar workers, especially uh, high school teachers and elementary teachers, but also healthcare workers, post telegraph, telegraph, uh, post telephone telegraph, engineers, and then scattered elsewhere. So these are people who were radicalized at university and who uh, all of these uh, categories of workers uh, have national unions that are affiliated with the UGTT uh, and the uh, National Union of Secondary School Teachers. In particular, for example, uh, has always had a very radical presence. No such thing can exist in Etof in Egypt. The security forces have repeatedly intervened to exclude from running for office anybody who, who does not agree with the government, whether that's a Muslim brother uh, on the right or communist on the left or any other variety in between. The big picture, I'm not going to talk very much about this because this we could go on for a very long time about and maybe you'll ask questions about it. So the main thing that is going on in the world, not only in the Middle East and North Africa, in the late 1970s, uh, early 1980s, is a major shift in the mode of capital accumulation. Fordism, Keynesianism, les trente glorieuses, the big expansion and st relative stability of capitalism after 1945, built on mass production, mass consumption, government spending to stimulate demand, so that's Fordism and Keynesianism, to flexible accumulation, meaning that uh, workers and capital are relatively more mobile. <coughs> capital goes wherever it wants, and workers go wherever capital uh, says they need to go if they get a job at all. So this crisis was brought on by lower ro profit rates in the 1960s, by a decade of stagnation and inflation, by the difficulty of the US government paying for both the Vietnam War and social welfare, and ultimately the symbol of that crisis was the delinking of the dollar from gold uh, on August 15, 1971. Until that day, uh, one ounce of gold was equal to $35, and making the dollar essentially the international standard currency also had to do with oil being bought in dollars and so on. This can get very complicated, so I won't stop to, uh, here. The new mode of capital accumulation, and this is using a specific terminology that the regulation school of political economy has developed. Uh, I happen to like this, but other ways of thinking about it are certainly possible. The new mode of ca capital accumulation is called flexible accumulation. You can also call it neoliberal globalization. <coughs> flexible accumulation, again, means that uh, there are far fewer rules on uh, what capital can do and uh, far fewer rights for labor. Less uh, uh, job uh, <coughs> security, lower benefits, lower wages, and so forth. The policies that uh, regulated this transition uh, came to be known as the Washington Consensus because the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the US Treasury, uh, are all in Washington. And John Williamson, an economist who was uh, a big proponent of the Washington Consensus, uh, put these policies together uh, in the form of Ten Commandments. I'm not going to review exactly what one needs to do. Uh, it's sort of technical. But the key point is that he was quite open that in the 1980s, Washington was essentially contemptuous of equity concerns. So the reason why the United States now has the biggest gap between the rich and the poor of any advanced capitalist country is because that's the, those policies were designed to do that. Uh, it was not a mistake or an error or inadvertent or something like that. Egypt has the honor of being the first of 146 countries 
to revolt against Washington consensus policies when they were applied in the global south. And the uh, occasion, Anwar Sadat announced a new open door economic policy in 1974, but really it was implemented only in January of 1977 uh, with the doubling of the price of bread and subsequently riots all over the country, which nearly brought the government down. This is the first moment when Islamists played a significant political role because they directed the crowds to burn down the casinos uh, on Pyramids Road thinking that we have a moral problem as opposed to we have an economic problem here. In, right after 1977, uh, you were still in the midst of the oil boom, so there were relatively few uh, collective actions by Egyptian workers until the oil bust began, 84, 85, 86, when the price of oil began to uh, come down. And by comparison with the 1950s, post-1952, 60s and 70s, this number of collective actions, and all the details here are, of course, not important for this purpose at all, the number of collective actions was about 33 a year. That's enormous compared to uh, Nasser uh, and uh, the Sadat era. So this is already impressive, but you ain't seen nothing yet. Egypt really only undertook uh, Washington p uh, consensus policies, which are known as economic reform and structural adjustment programs, in 1991. In 1991, it adopted a law specifying 314 public sector enterprises that were eligible for privatization. More than a decade later, because for this there was significant trade union resistance, the Unified Labor Law of 2003 was adopted. The big deal here was that workers can now be hired on temporary contracts. That means one minute, one hour, one day, one month, one year. Workers on temporary contracts cannot join trade unions, useless as they are in the Egyptian case in any case. Uh, they do not get the same social benefits, they get lower wages, and they can be fired the moment the contract is over at the sole discretion of the employer. So zero job security. This is great for Washington consensus policies. It, this is called flexibility of labor. These uh, pro, uh, policies were implemented in a much accelerated <coughs> way by uh, the government of Prime Minister Ahmed Nazif that was installed in July 2004. All of the financial ministries were in the hands of friends and cronies of the president's son, Gamal Mubarak. And so it was popularly called the government of businessmen. And there they are at the World Economic Forum in Sharm el having a good old time, um, uh, hobnobbing with the wealthy of the world to uh, which they aspired to uh, join. Once the economic reform and structural adjustment program was accelerated in 2004, so you want to look at um, this year here, immediate leap from 86 to 266 collective actions, 70% of which in, in 2004 occurred after the Nazif government was in school. So this is absolutely enormous. And the two million figure comes because I only have the numbers for the years that I specified there. This comes from reporting in the press. It's not precise. It's by order of magnitude. And that also explains why you get alternative figures. Uh, close enough, they don't really change the picture, but this is enormous. This is, hands down, the largest civic social movement in the Arab world since World War II, meaning it's not an armed struggle like Algeria, which of course mobilized many more people, but that's a different story. So it's just some high points. Uh, there was a municipal tax assessor's <coughs> strike in December of 2007, which resulted in a 325% wage increase. 7,000 uh, tax assessors and their families occupied the street in front of the Ministry of Finance. Their leader, Kamal Abu Eita, um, was politically astute, a brilliant organizer, and eventually they formed an independent trade union uh, outside the framework of the Egyptian Trade Union Federation. This is a strike that didn't actually happen. Uh, Mahala al-Kubra, Ghazal al-Mahala, is the single largest factory in the entire Middle East. 
uh, about 22,000 textile workers in integrated operations, spinning, weaving, bleaching, dyeing, and the whole, uh, and uh, uh, ready to wear clothing. They went out on two major strikes in 2006 and 2007. One enormous economic gains tried to call a strike for April 6, 2008 to win a 1,200 Egyptian pounds monthly minimum uh, wage. It was then about $220, so not very much. The security forces <coughs> aborted the strike, put pressure on people, and uh, attacked women and children who demonstrated over the high price of bread uh, at the end of the uh, first shift at 3.30 on April 6. And then there was an urban riot, uh, an uprising, and you can see from this uh, sign here, down with Mubarak, this is one of the few times during this very large movement that economic concerns are being linked to political concerns. This, this is exceptional, uh, although I wanted to show it to you because it's still very important. This entire movement was carried on when there were only two non-governmental organizations in the country, civil society organizations they are called, but I don't like that terminology, we can talk about that if you like, uh, that dealt primarily with workers' issues. There was the Center for Trade Union <coughs> and Worker Services, which was established in 1990 after Kamal Abbas, who's on the left, was fired for leading two strikes uh, at the Egyptian Iron and Steel Com Company. He was advised by Yusuf Darwish, who was a communist labor lawyer, and they found each other after Kamal Abbas was fired, and this organization still exists and does excellent work today. The other organization was the um, Committee for Trade Union and Workers' Rights and Liberties, which transformed itself in 2010 into the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights. Its uh, executive director is Khaled Ali, and the arrow points to him at a May 2010 demonstration in Cairo uh, demanding the uh, 1,200 pound monthly uh, minimum basic wage uh, for Egypt fans. That's Kamel Khalil down there in the right corner, if you know who's who in the um, Egyptian uh, social movement. Tunisia. So in the 1960s, Tunisia embarked on what was openly called a socialist experiment, not because President Habib Bourguiba had changed his stripes and had shifted from uh, francophone, pro-Western policies to socialism, but simply the, there wasn't enough capital in the country for Tunisia to become a capitalist country, so you had to have public investment and so on. The big proponent of this was Ahmed Ben Salah, um, and there were a lot of problems with it. I won't go into the details here. So he was booted out in 1969, and that's sort of the end of that, but actually not really, because in the next decade, there was even more public investment under private capitalism than there had been in the previous decade. One of the things that was a problem in Tunisia <coughs> is that because the trade union uh, federation was linked to the ruling party and the state, it tried very hard to restrain workers' wage demands in the name of national unity, uh, support for uh, growing the national economy, and so forth and so on. But by the mid-70s, as Tunisia moved farther and farther away from any kind of socialism at all, uh, the gap between wages and prices increased. And so you can <coughs> see about 1975, uh, a pretty sharp increase in strikes. I don't think this 409 number is right. I think this is more likely to be the right number, so because this is an anomalous and too many for this number of workers and so on. Uh, so we'll just assume then that the gap, the big jump comes here. Uh, so in those years, uh, the, Egyptian, the Tunisian Trade Union Federation was forced to make more room for people who had been radicalized in the 60s who argued, okay, Tunisia isn't a socialist country anymore, um, so the government is not going to defend the rights of workers. The trade union should defend the rights of workers, and we should have a more class struggle-oriented uh, 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 line. And the trade union leadership reluctantly adopted that point of view, which led to a clash with the government, 
and eventually a general strike on January 26, 1978, which the Trade Union Federation led in its own name. This was catastrophe. The government completely smashed them uh, using uh, weapons supplied by France and the United States. The whole trade union apparatus was crippled. Uh, leaders were put in jail. And the, the regime tried to take over the trade union and, and, and stop it from becoming as autonomous as it had come, had become. This chart shows you that they didn't succeed. Uh, strikes continued. And more importantly, the number of strikes without authorization, meaning they're wildcat strikes, that the trade union uh, federation leadership didn't approve of them. Local union committees might have approved of them because they are typically more militant, but these are strikes not only against employers, but effectively against the national trade union leadership. And um, they are, uh, there's quite a large number of them. Um, and the uh, peak is in 1983, 1984. And the result of that was bread riots in Tunisia on January 3rd, 1984, which were exactly the same and for exactly the same reason as the bread riots in Egypt in January of 1977. You would have thought that by now the IMF and the Washington consensus proponents would have learned something, but no, 146 different uprisings throughout the global south uh, over these very same issues, most typically uh, increasing sharply the, the price of bread. The Trade Union Federation did not call for these riots. They did not openly support them, but they very much opposed the vast repressive force that the government used to try to quash them. Tunisia at a a little bit earlier stage in some respects, a little bit later stage in other respects, went through the same economic reform and structural adjustment uh, policies as Egypt. The West liked to think that they were much more successful in Tunisia. And as a result, Tunisia <coughs> was allowed to join the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades in 1990, the World Trade Union, uh, the World Trade Organization in 1995, and Tunisia became the first Mediterranean southern country to uh, sign an association agreement with the EU in 1995. So that's it. Tunisia is part of the uh, European zone of the global uh, market uh, as far as these institutional arrangements are concerned. And Tunisia adopted a similar uh, labor law as Egypt adopted in 2003. The most important element of it was to increase the number of temporary contracts that any one employer could uh, give to uh, uh, workers from 15 to 50 percent, so up to half. Now, this is be better than Egypt, because in Egypt it could be 100 percent if, <laughs> if it's a new enterprise. Uh, and roughly the same uh, uh, consequences. Workers on temporary contracts have 25 to 40 percent lower wages. There is a word for this in French, precarisation. I haven't found a word in English for doing this to workers, uh, which has probably some significance. In France, they still have real trade unions. In America, we kind of don't. So Tunisia was considered to be a star pupil uh, of the, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and they wrote glowing things about how the Tunisian economic miracle, it was called. Workers didn't think so, and they continued to go on strike. And again, uh, you can see uh, not so much in the number of strikes, oops, sorry, not so much in the number of strikes, because 395 is not uh, larger by an order of magnitude than the years before it, but clearly from about 2003 <laughs> on, the number of strikers begins to increase pretty dramatically. Unfortunately, for reasons I have not figured out, the Tunisian government did not give the International Labor Organization strike figures after 2007. I have the sense that they begun to think of this as a state secret. At least they, that's how they behaved when I asked for them in Tunis last month. But the, the point being that there is a sharp, uh, there's a parallel between what's going on in Tunisia and in Egypt. 
despite the fact that Tunisia is a much smaller country, the strikes are generally much shorter, the number of people involved is much smaller, so forth and so on. The big exception in the Tunisian social mobilizations of the decade preceding 2011 is the uprising in the Gaza phosphate mining uh, basin from January to June 2008. The deal was that the Gaza company had been privatized even before, starting in uh, the 1980s, and no new workers had been hired, so its employment dropped from about 15,000 to about 5,000, so the entire area was in poverty before most male workers had jobs in the company or in uh, a, a businesses associated with it, and uh, now they did not. Phosphates is particularly destructive of the environment that it lives in because phosphates are used primarily for fertilizer. To use fertilizer, you need a certain amount of moisture. But phosphate deposits are found in arid areas. So Gafsa is a semi-desert. So the farms that are in Gafsa can't use the phosphates. They haven't got enough water. So you suck the phosphates out of Gafsa to the uh, port of Sfax from where they're shipped to Europe and where else. Um, and people of, of, of uh, Gaza, <coughs> who used to have jobs and were doing OK, now have none. So the company posted uh, a list of uh, some 200 new jobs that, uh, that were uh, supposed to be al allocated by a competitive exam and by giving preference to uh, uh, children of minors who had been killed in work accidents, uh, uh, children of widows, and because the, the whole area was dependent on the phosphate mines in the joint. Workers immediately, unemployed workers immediately complained. They said, this list doesn't reflect the scores that people actually got in the exam. This is a nepotistic collaboration between the local head of the phosphate miners union, who also happens to own three companies that provide temporary labor for uh, contracting for cleaning and other such things for the mines. And uh, there were sit-ins and marches, and uh, all four of the phosphate mining towns joined in at one point or another. Not a great deal of support from the intelligentsia and tunes. OK, to summarize the story then, what's different about tunes? First, the UGTT had a certain historic legitimacy, which comes from its participation in the nationalist movement, independent of the political party, and the fact that French colonial authorities stupidly assassinated the Secretary General of the UGTT in 1952, making him into a martyr for the nationalist cause. And till this day, the people in Tunisia speak about this, and the UGTT is unassailable, that its nationalist legitimacy is unassailable. Second, because of its political autonomy, it also had independent organizational capacity. So it has a vast bureaucracy, not always a good thing, but if people sitting in Tunis decide that people in SAC should go on a general strike, that can happen. It can happen even if they don't decide that, but certainly if they do, it's quite easy. Third, the UJTT was always involved in politics. They had members in the parliament as UJTT members, of course, supporting the ruling Neo Destour or later the RCD, the ruling party, but they were not afraid of politics. And around the phosphate basin and other poor governorates of the center west, you had a strong tradition of regional dissidents. The phosphate uh, revolt was one of only many. Uh, expressions of that. Uh, and in this region in particular, but as well throughout the country, you had all sorts of insurgent local leaders uh, with a left political uh, orientation. These are just a collection of the names I met uh, in and around Gafsa uh, last month uh, when I was in Tunisia. Uh, Adnan Haji won a seat as an independent leftist in the Tunisian parliament in the October. Uh, of 2014 elections, Amr Amrusia won a seat on the Popular Front uh, ticket. Abdesalam Hidouri came in second in Menkel Buzayan. He was about 200 votes away from winning a seat. Uh, and Ali Zeri in Sidi Buzayan didn't run uh, for office. If we look at the same period in Egypt, so Egyptian workers having 
mounted this massive movement have no organization. And then in the middle of the occupation of Tahrir Square, which began on January 25th, a bunch of them get together, including, most importantly, the uh, Real Estate Tax Authority uh, Union. And they say, okay, we are going to have an Egyptian Federation of Independent Trade Unions, not the Egyptian Trade Union Federation. We're going to be independent from the government. And the banner says, uh, Ifitu supports the demands of the popular revolution and calls for a general strike, which never happened. Why did the general strike not happen? Because this organization, at this moment, is 12 hours old. How are they going to call a general strike in a country of 80 million people when you know, they are a few hundred in Cairo and nobody in Aswan ever even heard that this thing exists, let alone that they would listen to what they are called to do? Nonetheless, the number of strikes and other collective actions of Egyptian workers skyrocketed in 2011 reaching three times more than most years in the decade before, with somewhere around a million workers participating. My estimate is low. The high is somebody else's, a Trotskyist estimate. Uh, so uh, the average is close to a million. So all of this is going on while there is still only the most minimal national organization. The Egyptian Federation of Independent Trade Unions is just getting off the ground in February, and February is the month when there's the largest single number of actions, and you know, workers are just doing their thing, and there are now there are economic demands linked to political demands and so on. And this continued um, up through the last period that I have any serious numbers for, the first quarter of 2014. <coughs> uh, last week there was, again, uh, or I think the sixth time in the last two years, a strike at Mahala in Mahala in Mahal al Kubra. Uh, so very, very elevated numbers. For 2013, the numbers I have are too high, I, I, so I didn't put them down, uh, but they're consistent with the numbers uh, around. But in the first uh, parliamentary elections, which were invalidated uh, subsequently, but nonetheless, it gives us an idea of what's going on, only one trade unionist, Kamal Abu Aita, the first the president of the Real Estate Tax Authority Union, and then he became the president of the Egyptian Federation of Independent Trade Unions, won a seat in the parliament. That's it, just one. Uh, in the meantime, the Egyptian Federation of uh, Independent Trade Unions split. The old Etuf, uh, Egyptian Trade Union Federation leadership was restored, so it became the same kind of bureaucratic state-run uh, organization that it had always been. And there has been none, zero legislation uh, uh, legalizing trade union pluralism, and uh, no real structural improvement in the status of workers beyond wage increases and the like that individual groups of workers were able to win by going on strike or protesting or sitting in or doing whatever they do at their specific workplaces. At the national level, the only uh, difference that has happened is that there is now for public sector workers a monthly minimum basic wage of $700, but that is now something like $100 a month because the, the Egyptian pound has been vastly inflated, uh, and it's not clear that everybody is even getting that. Tunisia, you have the same phenomenon, continuing escalation of industrial actions. These figures were apparently leaked by the Ministry of Social Affairs to the Nawat website, uh, but I couldn't get any actual document that, that seemed official, but it seems right. I'll, I won't go further than, than that in, in this, insisting that these numbers are uh, precise or anything like that. But in contrast, the UGTT was in the thick of the political action both before and after the ouster of uh, Zain al-Abdin Ben Ali. The national leadership approved no strikes from the day that uh, Mohammed Bouazizi uh, immolated himself on December 17, 2010, until January 11, uh, 2011. Ben Ali left on January 14. So the national UJTT leadership was very, very late to the game. But on the local level, and even on the national sector level, like National Union of Secondary Teachers, they were the backbone of a revolt. 
yes, there was social media. Yes, youth were very much to the fore. But they met at UGTT local headquarters. Marches proceeded from UGTT local headquarters. The UGTT local leadership was the one who brought tents to uh, sit-ins and so forth. So they were not necessarily the most prominent activists, but they provided the logistical infrastructure to make this uprising possible. Then there is the uh, dominant role of the Nahda in the constituent assembly that was elected in October of uh, 2011. And the Ujetite has always been militantly secular, so they're clashing right away. And uh, finally, the Ujetite is after we've had it, we are uh, calling a general strike for December 13, 2012. And then after all sorts of negotiations, the Ujetite decides, based on its intense spirit of responsibility to preserve the superior interests of the nation, we're not going to go on strike. And that's what they had done from the beginning. They pushed it to the brink, and then they don't go over the brink because they have this sense of national responsibility. But you could take this two ways. You could say, oh, well, that's because they're trade union bureaucrats and they're thinks and, <coughs> and so forth. And you could also say, they are showing that they can make this government fall if they want. So, chill out. Well, government try to chill out, but the radicals behind the government did not. Uh, jihadis assassinated two important uh, secular left-wing leaders uh, in 2013. And then the UJT said, uh, said, okay, that's enough. This government is over. Just like that. This government is over. We are going to have a national dialogue that is going to uh, involve four parties. First, us. And UJT is far and away the biggest and the strongest of these groups. Second, um, Utica, you could call that the Chamber of Commerce, all the Zabuka, the Bar Association, and the Tunisian Human Rights Center. And these four groups started to meet on October 25th, 2013, and basically they are preparing to throw the Ananda uh, leadership of the Constituent Assembly out to uh, trash the constitution that they were working on on the grounds that it didn't have enough uh, se uh, sec uh, securities for human rights and freedom of religion and uh, women's equality and so on. And um, by January of uh, 2014, uh, they do that. And then, uh, having installed a constitution first, uh, which is a the right way to do things, unlike what Egypt uh, did, um, you then uh, had an election in which the results show both the power of the Ujitite and its limits. So Nida Tunis, a party formed by, led by Beji Ikai Gesepsi, who was subsequently elected in December uh, president of Tunisia as well, is a coalition which includes businessmen, Utica on the one hand, and some important elements of the Ujetite. Feminists, big role because they're terrified of Agnathna and not necessarily unjustly so. People who we could call secular fundamentalists, people whose education is French and whose form thinking is French and they don't want any Islamism. And uncomfortably, a hefty sprinkling of former uh, members of, the, of Ben Ali's ruling party. Uh, the Democratic Constitutional uh, Assembly, obviously, then. And Nahda came in second. The Free Patriotic Union, which is just a, a rich guy who owns a lot of media, got 16 seats. The Popular Front, which is the United Left, 15 seats. And uh, Adnan Hedji, who led the Gafsa uprising in Rodeaf, won a seat as an independent. He has a problem with the leadership of the Popular Front, uh, which was, to be sure, uh, ultra Stalinist uh, before. The, pull back a little bit from that uh, now. So the argument then is that um, the, in Tunisia, the UGTT was able, with many problems, to play a leading role in installing what is a procedural democracy. Not a social revolution by any means. This is not a revolution, but a procedural democracy. 
In Egypt, despite having a much larger movement, workers and trade unions have not only failed to install procedural democracy, their social status relative to the regime is perhaps even worse now than 